that I'm the interpretation officer with the National Park Authority. And, in, and interpretation doesn't mean that I translate things into French and German. My job is to essentially what's known as promote um, enjoyment and understanding of the special qualities of the National Park. Um, and as most of you will know, we were very lucky um, to have incorporated a few years ago now um, a, a new large area of the National Park into the National Park um, to the northwest, um, taking in a lot of what was once known as Westmoreland, but, and which we now call the Westmoreland Dales within the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Um, as part um, early on, um, I mean, obviously a very large area with virtually no interpretation, a huge lot of work needed um, to sort of bring it up to what you might call national park standards. Um, we put together a scheme with the Friends of the Lake District to, uh, to the National Lottery uh, and gathered um, millions of pounds um, for the Westmoreland Dales Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, and my little bit of that is, is this A Way Through project, um, because knowing the area a little bit, I already knew that the, the landscape um, is a fascinating one for those who are interested in communication and transport and the effect that that has on local communities. Um, and anyone who's bombed up the M6 or caught the train um, up to Carlisle will know um, the amazing geology and geography of that area and the way that it allows routes both around it and through it. Um, so that was the beginning of my project. I'm not used to being on such a large screen. So let me just um, advance. Yay, so there we go. Now, um, you'll notice a, uh, a URL at the bottom there. That is to the blog um, that I produce. Every, all the three projects that you've already heard mentioned have a blog to go with them. And those blogs are essentially where I place the research as I do it, the community work as I do it, and then the results of all that community work. And it's essentially that those blogs are an archive. Uh, and they're, they're really worth going back and having a look at because there's lots and lots of information, which so, only some of which will actually enter into the sort of public area out in the actual landscape itself. Um, lots of images and photographs and stuff. Now, don't bother writing that down. The, the best thing to do, I find, is to just Google a way through Westmoreland and that'll bring you up to the first page, and then it's got all the blog posts listed in order. That's much the way, best way to go about it. So that was the project. Um, I'm now in the final year of that project, so the research is all done, um, and in fact, it was maybe it was some time ago that I did some of this research, so I apologise if I'm having to refer to my notes, because it tends to go in, in one brain cell and out the other um, as I'm doing it, which is another reason for having the blog. All the information is there. So... Uh, I started out my um, working life as an archaeologist, um, hence the doctor bit, and um, I was actually a Roman archaeologist, but I've discovered in uh, the Westmoreland Dales the most incredible um, archaeology, and this site, I don't know whether any of you know this, this is Shap Avenue, has anybody ever um, told you about that, or have you ever visited? I mean, it doesn't look like that now, but that's what it looked like in the 18th century before large parts of it were blown up and used as um, foundations for walls and building stone, um, tragically. Antiquarians at the time were obviously very upset about that. Anyhow, so what's this got to do with communication? It, it is, um, it gave Shap its name, first of all. Shap actually comes from heap, as in heap of stones. Uh, and it's more than likely that the reference is an old Norse word, and it's more than likely that that was a reference to this extraordinary avenue, which at one time was actually second in size only to um, the famous one at um, West Kennet. So a remarkable processional avenue, let me just see the distance, one and a half miles, uh, built from the pink Shap um, granite, probably hundreds of stones originally, and it runs in a straight line um, with, at the southern end, a stone circle, um, and the northern end, it, does, it takes a little bit of a, a sort of dog leg. In fact, the, it's a possibility it might be two avenues, one on top of the other. It takes a dog leg and ends up um, beyond a huge glacial erratic called um, Thunderstone, which is always an interesting thing. Um, 
So um, Shap was clearly an incredibly important place at one point in the Neolithic. Okay, that, I don't know how clear that is to you, um, but that is some work done by an archaeologist Tom, called Tom Clare. Um, and you can see, pointer, this is, this is him mapping all the stones that he thought probably once upon a time belonged to the avenue. And even though there's only a few left that are named, like um, the Goggleby stone here, um, you can see, in fact, there's a very distinct avenue of stones. And there's, there's another um, drawing here. And you can see this dog leg here. So one and a half miles long, quite incredible. Um, so it's remarkable by any standard in Britain, and I don't know why it's not better known. Um, but the link to communication. If you examine the landscape around Shap and around where this avenue is, and specifically the high land either side, which will eventually lead into the Loon Gap, which is where the M6 runs, um, the local history group has actually identified, well, not exactly hundreds, but many, many tens of other ritual sites on the high ground either side of this route through the landscape. Uh, and in fact, the Shap uh, Local History Society, they found um, burial mounds, stone circles, ring cairns, and barrows. And they've actually got an interactive map on their website that you can go and have a look at, which is really interesting. So an incredible concentration uh, and, and complexity of ritual places. I mean, this, this says that the communities that lived in this area must have had um, remarkable resources to be able to spend so much time building stuff like this. You know, they're not living hand to mouth. They've got people with spare time who can spend that time creating stuff like this. Um, and it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that the most imposing monument of them all is actually situated at the entrance, if you look on the map, at the entrance to the land that leads into the Loon Gorge and the Loon Gap. Um, so, what was going on? It's going to move. Try again. Yay! Okay. So here you go. Here are some of the large stones that still survive. Um, you can see uh, the Goggleby stone there. I mean, they are imposing huge things here and here. And a lot more have been found in the walls. That's how Tom Clare managed to um, map it all out. Right. Um, so, what was going on? By the late Neolithic, there's some very long established lines of exchange in use um, throughout the British Isles. And scarce commodities like salt and polished stone axes had, a, had an enormous value to, to people at the time because they only came from very... Um, limited places um, and their their value um, was prized all over the country and they were moved long distances we know this from the archaeological record um, possibly through large numbers of small exchanges and um, axe rough outs so not polished but the rough outs before they were polished um, were uh, uh, quarried in factories in Great Langdale. I'm sure you know the, the, uh, the stone axe quarries in the Lake District up at Great Langdale. Uh, and these, these axe rough outs have been found the length of, and breadth of, of Britain. And they were polished up to their final beautiful form some distance from where they were quarried. So they were carried as rough outs, but polished up at much further distances. And sea routes, from the locations where they've been found, it looks like sea routes were the main way that these rough outs travelled all these long distances because they're found at coastal places, um, such as uh, the Humber Estuary and along the west coast of Cumbria. But there's also a concentration of these axe rough outs uh, around Penrith to the north and in the Air Valley where we are um, to the south. And it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to see this loon gap as lying along a really, really important um, route south for these sought-after axes and, and probably other essentials like um, salt um, from the coast um, and cattle too. Um, and controlling access to these routes, um, particularly where there's a sort of ge ge geological pinch point like the loon gap, 
it, it must have conveyed importance to the people that lived there. Um, and it would have been a place um, where, um, you, you know, essentially that trade was controlled and there were checkpoints and you had to pass through it in order to get your stuff further south. And this was one of the places, these sort of, um, they call them liminal, these, these sort of shoreline places where, where lots and lots of different communities rubbed up together before things then travelled on. Um, so I, I think that, this, that the people that lived in this area um, controlled access to these routes and this, this control um, gave great power to them. And so this grand processional avenue where people would have, would have moved up and down and the, and the circle at the far end of it, um, they would have been part, a big reflection of that status. Um, so power and privilege was actually reinforced for those who participated in these rituals and handled the goods um, and controlled the exchange as they moved north and south. But the story doesn't stop there. I'm pointing it the wrong way, aren't I? Okay. Two of the stones, Goggleby and Aspers, that actually still are still standing, have what are called cup marks on them which are these indentation, indentations that you can see here with a circle around. And there's a, a long distance view of it there. And these strange symbols, sometimes um, surrounded by rings, they're often known as cup and ring marks. There's lots in Northumberland, if you know that area well. Um, and they're found extensively across northern Britain, and they've been, people have done a lot of research into them because they're very enigmatic, you know, it's really very unclear what they're for. People have tried pouring blood sacrifices into them to see whether the stone, the, you know, the cups fill up. But of course, you know, that's not going to work because it's on its side like that. So, yeah, lo lots of theories, <clears throat> but it's very unlikely that they were actually just decoration. They, they seem to have had some sort of purpose. Now, in the 1980s, um, there's been a lot, there was a lot of research um, finding the locations of these um, cup and ring marks. Uh, and there's a particular concentration of these carvings in low-lying sites, again, in the Penrith area of the Eden Valley. Um, so you can see there's um, Asper's stone and Goggleby stone at Shap. This is the Penrith area, and this is the Eden here. And here you can see you've got cup and ring marks on at various sites heading north, sort of on this um, eastern side of the Eden Plain. And here we've got some of the um, sites possibly associated with sea transport there on the coast, but we won't, we'll ignore those for the moment. So, concentration of sites in the Eden Valley. Um, and um, several of those carved stones actually form part of stone circles um, or were incorporated into burials. And uh, of those with cup and ring marks, at least three have very similar design, a cup surrounded by two or three rings with a causeway through. Now, a gen an archaeologist called Paul Frodsham wrote that such similarities between these carvings is not coincidental. There's a meaning in them which was so universally recognised that people throughout very wide areas of northern Britain were somehow drawn to execute independently such strikingly similar designs. So again, we're looking at a sort of communication network, a very wide range of communication across the north of Britain. And now I came across the research of um, a woman called Kate Sharp, um, who has been looking at uh, cup and ring mark sites in the Lake District. And she's, in, she's actually uncovered loads more of these examples. Now, in the Cumbrian High Fells, travellers are um, naturally channeled along particular paths, and she calls these natural corridors of movement. And she's actually studied the geographical locations of these um, various cup and ring sites, and she finds them that they're often at the head or tail of lakes. Um, and in fact, she, she superimposed on this map here the network of um, pa uh, more, far more recent pack horse routes, this, um, which ran across the fells. And many of the, these cup, Neolithic cup and ring marks are found where these routes cross each other. So the old high fell routes, um, you can see the dotted lines um, 
running across the fells, and you can see how many of them join where these cup and ring marks are found, and as, as she says, at the head or tail of lakes as well. So a, an interesting pattern she's found in the landscape. So a clear association with these arterial routes, possibly using boats on the lakes, and at key sites with regard to inter-valley communication. And she, her theory is that these carved stones, they're actually on outcrops, so they're not carried, they're actually part of the natural geology of the area. Um, they possibly mark places where groups congregated and either crossed paths or continued their journeys together, as places where people converged, arriving either on foot or by water along the valley or from a mountain pass, setting out or heading stone, uh, stone heading home. Um, she also theorises that these would have been probably used on a seasonal basis during the Neolithic um, lowland communities, they weren't actually living at Great Langdale, um, digging out these stone, uh, stone axe rough outs. Um, it was probably lowland communities that came up um, in the summertime. They probably brought their cattle and sheep with them as well to the high pastures during the summer months and exploited the quarries at the same time. So she's done more research. She, she's looked at continental contexts. Um, and she thinks that they're not just way markers or meeting points from some of this continental evidence that she adds into her theory, that they may have been associated with ensuring the successful outcome of a journey or ensuring the goodwill of local spirits. Travelling was always and has always been hazardous. So stone circles, like the one that stood at the southern end of the Shap Avenue, I, my theory, and I think most archaeologists would probably agree, um, were actually um, places where people, distant communities, gathered. They gathered from lots of other places. They came together at these stone circles, and they exchanged items, like I say, these stone axes. These are some from the collection at the Dales Countryside Museum that have travelled down Wensleydale. Um, they exchanged goods like this, the salt that I talked about. There would have been feasting, it's more likely, because they, they found a lot of cattle bones um, buried in pits in some of these stone circles. And um, the, we also find that the, the cup carvings that we find on the sites like Shap um, are much more complex than the ones that Kate Sharp describes in the Lake District. So they're, they're, they, they seem to be a little bit different. It seems they're much more to do with exchange rituals, and community ceremonies rather than as journey markers. Um, but it's not hard to imagine that perhaps they mark particularly important end points for journeys or starting points for new ones. So there's still this association with communication, the coming together and then the movement away. Now, within the project areas, I've already said that there, there are um, a lot of, uh, a lot, a number of Neolithic stone circles, and I think there may well be much more to discover about them as this example, um, uh, if this example is anything to go by. This was a, a circle that uh, was destroyed uh, by um, Hardendale Quarry, but in advance of that destruction, um, an excavation, a full excavation took place. Now, what they actually had on the site was a, a fairly unremarkable early Bronze Age ring cairn, so a circle of stones, and there are a lot of those in the Yorkshire Dales and uh, Westmoreland. So stone piled in a sort of donut shape, and you can, you can see a lot of them. There's, there's quite a few around Sedba, for instance. Um, however, when they actually removed the ring cairn, what they found underneath was evidence for a Neolithic timber circle, a henge, with two concentric rings of oak post, probably once linked by timber lintels, and lo and behold, cattle bones were associated with the structure. So a meeting place, a feasting place, an exchange place. Now these prehistoric um, timber circles, I don't need to have to tell you, these are very, very rare finds um, in Britain, but this is an extraordinary four-phase site. Um, so it suggests that some of the Bronze Age sites, which are so common, actually may lie on much earlier ones. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 the timber was replaced by um, stone, so it became a stone circle, uh, concent two concentric rings, and then later on it became the ring cairn 
um, with a central grave pit that probably once contained a crouched skeleton. And there's a whole rabbit hole of research that I won't go into, but uh, which is all around this idea of communities that were communal and met in these places. And then as society changed um, and became more concentrated on the, the sort of chieftains, the big men, these ritual sites became much more about a single person or a single family rather than a community, which is very fascinating. But anyway, that's by the by. Uh, and this, just to show you, near, near to that site, which is now long destroyed, is another stone circle, the Oddendale Stone Circle, another one of these extraordinary double-ringed um, circles, um, Neolithic and Early Bronze, Bronze Age. And this one is on the ridge of the watershed between the Livernet and Lowther Valleys, and location is very important, as we saw with the Shap Avenue and this commanding place that it's sited. This one um, is very prominent and visible uh, on the edges, probably, of territories where people could safely travel to and meet. So a whole area of really interesting research there. But they are small fry compared to some of the... Um, circles that you find in the richer lowlands of the Eden Valley. Um, uh, and I've just put a couple up there. The Maybra Henge above near Penrith and Long Meg to the right. That one that's sort of along the side of the Eden. Uh, remarkable sites. Um, uh, an archaeologist called Mark Edmund um, has actually looked at these and he's written that the purposes served by these sites may have varied from one place in time to another but it does seem that a number were situated on important lines of communication. Many lie close to major rivers or natural access routes. And these stone circles in um, eastern Cumbria, they, they cluster around the routes which cross the Pennines. Many sites, I mean, you can imagine something like that, it would have taken thousands of hours of labor for their construction. And it's the link with access routes suggests a concern with lines of contact which extended beyond the immediate social horizon. And these are some of the stone circles that I show you here. And they all lie close to roots. So, for instance, the Maybra Henge, it lies close to the north-south A6 and later M6. Um, and the junction of them with the A66 that runs east towards the Stainmore Gap, which, of course, became later on a very important Roman road. Long Meg lies between the River Eden, which is probably a prehistoric route north-south, as we've seen from those stone, uh, the, the cup and ring marks up and down that side there. Um, and Long, and um, uh, yeah, she lies beside the modern A686 running east over the North Pennines. And when I look at some of the smaller stone circles in the Westland area, I see an awful lot of them lie beside Roman roads, uh, pack horse routes, drove routes. It's no coincidence, no coincidence. They, they lie along those routes. So that was a little prehistoric rabbit hole that I went down in my research. Let's change to a completely different period of time. So these routes through the landscape, thousands of years later, were still being trudged along, and they were still carrying travelers and traders. Now, there would have been a lot of peddlers selling their wares from remote farmhouse to country fair to town market, carrying their packs of goods. But alongside them was a really rather interesting set of people called chap men and women. And they were a specialised sort of peddler who sold cheap reading material in the form of folded paper booklets called chap books. And these are all illustrations from those chap books. And there are some remarkable collections of these chap books. Um, which you can actually access online, which is where I found a lot of this information. So the tradition arose in the 16th century, as soon as printed books became affordable, and the, the sale of these chapbooks was probably at its height in the 17th and 18th century. Um, <clears throat> by the mid-18th century, male literacy rates, you notice male, not female, were, in Britain, were up to around 60%. And so these, these really sort of relatively inexpensive books. They were actually aimed at working people and their children. 
Um, so it's probably likely that they were bought to be read aloud at gatherings of less literate friends. So you could imagine a jolly evening at an inn or a private house. Um, and many of the poems that are contained in them would probably have been sung. Um, and the, the stories are very scurrilous and in some places quite rude. So it's quite, quite funny. Um, <laughs> Chat books, they were sold in their millions, though very few of them survive. Um, the, the paper was very rough and cheap, and most would have ended up wrapping things like bread or even as bum fodder. I'll leave you to imagine what that means. Um, if you were very poor, then um, you were probably exposed to um, broadsides, and these were particularly meant to be read out. And these were kind of the red tops of their day. Um, very... Uh, just an illustrated printed sheets, very um, bloodthirsty or with ballads that people could sing. And this is actually the, the account of the, the dreadful deeds and eventual execu execution of the notorious murderer Barney Maguire. And he'd, he'd, apparently he'd already been jailed on a Hulk ship for highway robbery and, he, and murder at Appleby Fair in, in our area but escaped, and after a spree of break-ins and robbery, ended up murdering a Kendall shopkeeper. But he was pursued by the shopkeeper's son, and he was caught near Stafford, so that must have been quite a chase. And there he is, hanging on the gibbet in the, in the drawing. So they lasted until newspapers became um, cheap enough for people to be able to afford. Um, we don't know, we know very little about the people um, who carried these in Westmoreland, uh, but we know that they existed because of some of the sources that have been hunted out. I spent a lot of time um, in the uh, British newspaper archive, which is a fabulous resource if you have access to it. Um, and I did find evidence for some chap men and women. This is, uh, you can see James Petty there from Kirby Stephen, and he's been declared bankrupt. Um, he probably was in debt to the publishers of his stock of chapbooks. Printers supplied chapbooks on credit to Chapman, who then um, walked these enormous routes all around um, the north of England um, and, and elsewhere, and he, he would then um, sell door-to-door -door and at markets and fairs, and then eventually they would return um, to pay for the stock sold. And he would have hoped to sell his books with James at around a penny each, um, which was a markup of around 300%. So relatively lucrative um, if he could drum up enough business. And, and I was lucky enough to come across a historian called um, Barry Mackay, who lives in Appleby, and he's done a lot of detailed work on Cumbrian Chapman, and he very kindly shared his notes with me. And I have to say, as part of this project, so many local historians have been so generous with photographs and research, pieces that they've written that haven't published, that they've just let me have, and I've been able to publish them on the blog under their name. So these are some of the covers um, from chapbooks uh, which I've um, come across. And he's found some examples. Um, he found a peddler called John Littleton from Fellside in Kendall. And in 1685, he was the husband of Catherine Littleton, who was also a chapman woman until at least 1705. And she paid £8 for her licence. Peddlers all had to have licenses. And eight pounds is double what a, a peddler on foot would pay. So it suggests that she had a horse. And you can actually see a little illustration here of a, a peddler laden with goods with a horse. Another one that Barry found was Thomas Rudd of Appleby. We only know that he had a daughter who was born to him and his wife Elizabeth at Appleby Jail. So a little sad tale there. It's presumably a debtor. Um, and Anne Bell. Now, she was one of two very important publishers based in Penrith. Again, we talk about Penrith a lot. It was a very important place in terms of communication. Um, she printed over 100 chapbooks in the late 18th and early 19th century, and so that would actually make Penrith the centre of chapbook printing in the north. So, it, you know, Westmoreland would have had plenty of access to these, 
it's quite hard to imagine it sometimes when you, you when you see how remote some of the farmsteads and little hamlets are in Westland. But uh, they would have had access to the outside world and some of these very funny stories. Yeah, worth a read. We don't know. I mean, we've got some little illustrations there, a little uh, rough illustrations of what these people look like. But it's obviously not until the 19th century that we we begin to see faces. Uh, of the people that travel these routes through Westmoreland. And I particularly love this smart turnout. This, this was one of, one of the many photographs uh, lent to me by a local historian, uh, in this case, uh, Anne Taylor. So the, here we have a Mr. W. Bainbridge, and he's driver of the mail gig. So he would have been delivering mail. Um, I don't know what date that is, but I'm presuming... In, uh, um, early 20th century, late 19th, early, probably early 20th century. Um, so he would have been delivering mail to properties around the area once it had, it had arrived at Kirby Stephen. And I've actually managed to track down where the post office was and where his horse and gig was stabled in Kirby Stephen, which is all part of the interesting research. Uh, attaching locations to some of these stories. So, how did they get the mail? Well, it arrived by mail coach in the 18th century and early 19th century. And again, my research in um, local newspapers has re revealed lots of interesting information. So, on the left-hand side here, you have information about where the uh, post, the mail and post coaches, as they call them, left. And they all, well, a lot of them had really interesting names. So, we have the Telegraph, we have the North Britain, an elegant coach, um, um, and they all left um, at set times uh, and from set places. Um, cheapest coach on the road. And they obviously, as well as carrying the mail, carried passengers. Um, uh, but they obviously had problems. Um, there's a report on the right-hand side here where the London Mail has been held up by heavy snow um, in its passage over Shap Fells. And the, um, I was born in Wigton, um, so I know the A6 as it uh, was um, over those very remote fells, and I can only imagine what it must have been like trying to get a coach and horses um, through that snow. However, what happened was that the driver um, would um, unharness horses from the coach, and he would strap the mail bags onto those horses and he would deliver the mail come hell or high water. That was the promise. And that's the photograph of that happening um, in Birmingham. Uh, a lithograph. And you can see everything. There's the coach in the background, <laughs> stuck in snow. So, Chap, a very... It's interesting, isn't it, that the, um, the communication route goes over the fells rather than up the loom gap. But that's another, that's another story. So that's mail coaches. Uh, and that, that whole rabbit hole started with that lovely photograph of that mail gig. Uh, and here's another rabbit hole, which was carriers. And these lovely photographs were given to me by a lady called Heather Ballantyne. And this was known as the Orton Carrier, Orton being one of the lovely little villages in the Westland Dales, lovely place to visit, um, has a chocolate factory, if that helps, um, and a really nice little farmer's market. So here we have the Orton Carrier, and he was called John William Lund, and he and his son Billy, you can see in the, in the um, carriage there at the top. So what was a carrier? Well, Heather Ballantyne writes, uh, she, no, she didn't write, she recorded um, son Billy, um, that, that, that lad there, she recorded his memories of um, being a carrier. No, I beg your pardon, it was Hilary Wilson who recorded it and then gave it to Heather. And this is an extract. Every Monday morning they set off for Kendall, not via the most direct route, which is about 14 miles, but zigzagging here and there to either side of the main road to pick up butter, cheese, boxes of eggs, and even shopping lists from the farms. So they actually shopped 
for, for people, carried money and shopped and brought goods back. Often the goods were left on stands at the lane end to save time. There was little theft in the countryside then, despite the lean times of the 20s and 30s. And then on arrival in Kendal, the goods were delivered to the shops, the horses stabled and the shopping lists filled. And it, they obviously stayed in Kendal because the next morning it was back to Orton, following much the same route and making their deliveries. And they made this trip three times a week all year round. And there's a lovely description of the, these two horses. Um, there was a particularly nasty slope um, at Docker Brow out of Kendal. And apparently what they do is that they take um, the, lead, the um, lead horse here, the grey, and harness it to the back. Uh, and basically the, the, <laughs> the trace horse, that's the, um, the grey, uh, was, uh, had the, the brakes were screwed on and they would launch themselves over the edge. Uh, and the shaft horse, which is that one there, there was a canny old Irish draft mare and she would half squat and brace herself as they started to slide. And obviously Grey at the back was obviously providing some braking as well. Uh, and they'd reach the corner and then Billy and his dad would put their shoulders to the wagon side and physically heave the back end round so it was lined up for the second part of the descent. All in a day's work, said Billy to Hillary. So yeah, very dramatic. They're quite reminiscent, these wagons, of um, the old uh, Western wagons. You know, the Botox wagons with the canvas? And not only would they carry people, uh, goods, they would also carry passengers if there was room. Uh, so I, I found that absolutely fascinating, that story. So I did a bit more research, and in the um, censuses, I found um, some more um, carrier families. Um, in particular, um, a woman called um, Elizabeth or Betsy Nelson. And she was actually part of a family of carriers, I discovered, um, which ran over five generations, dating back to the 1770s, based in New Biggin on Loon, um, which lies on another one of these really important routes that runs east-west from T-Bay to Kirby Stephen. Um, she lived to the grand old age of 84, and I actually was taken to see her gravestone at Ravenstone Dale Churchyard. Now, I knew from the 1894 Directory of Westmoreland that in the year um, 1894, she operated a regular carrier service between Kendall and Kirby Stephen. And she did that alongside another Ravenstone Dale based carrier called Robert Bowsfield. And so I then looked through these Kelly's directories, again, which are all available online. Um, and from 1894 to 1910, I found that there was a carrier called Nelson and another called Bowsfield in each volume right up to 1906. And they seemed to run a roughly parallel service from the Rosen Crown Inn in Kendall and the Golden Fleece in Kirby Stephen, which um, this, this is a photograph of here, the Golden Fleece. That looks a bit rough and ready, doesn't it? Um, but there's obviously a little archway through which um, a horse and... Uh, cart could be driven to stables at the back. And um, it's actually where Age UK um, is uh, in the Market Square in Kirby Stephen, for those that know it. Uh, and behind that arch, there were rooms, apparently. So that gives a little bit of local colour. Now, I'm assuming that one of those rooms must have been the one that's mentioned in this report, which I won't read out to you, but essentially it reports the theft of cheese from Elizabeth's father, Michael, in 1843 by a likely lad who pretended he'd got permission to go in and... Was it? Oh, we went in to get a bucket, I think, to wash, wash something. Anyway, he nicked, he nicked some cheeses and one was found partly eaten in his house, so that was a bit of a smoking gun. Um, and then I tracked Elizabeth and her family with the help of a genealogist. And I just built up this amazingly fascinating picture of these, these people. Um, this is um, Michael again, and he seems a little accident prone. Uh, I put that in inverted commas. Um, I, suspect, I suspect that as it <laughs> happened 100 yards from the Jolly Farmers Inn uh, in uh, Kirby Stephen, um, he fell off his cart um, and broke his leg, can you imagine, in the 19th century. And he obviously healed, 
um, and uh, was still working, but I imagine he might have been a little bit the worse for wear. And you can see evidence in this um, for the fact that they offered a passenger service as well, so he was carrying people home as well as all the goods. And with the help of this genealogist, I've traced them back even further. This was um, a common carrier called John Nelson. This is an 1826 death notice. And what I like about this one um, is the fact that he's described as a man of the strictest honesty, integrity, and punctuality in all his dealings. And these are obviously really important factors if you are a carrier, carrying goods um, and money for your local community. So he would have been well loved in his... his uh, his area in Ravenstone Dale and New Biggin. I think this might be um, Elizabeth's great grandfather. Uh, he would have been born just as the new turnpike roads were being built through the area, and that would have provided him with the perfect opportunity to set up a new business with horse drawn carts, wheeled horse drawn carts. Before that date, the 18th century and all the way back probably to the Roman era, definitely the medieval era, all the goods would have been carried on the backs of pack horses over the hills. But these turnpike roads just absolutely opened up the world for Westmoreland, um, for fast traffic. So this, gen this John Nelson, four more generations after him, fulfilling all these shopping lists, handing over produce, collecting money. <clears throat> and now, I talked about pack horses. Interestingly, this is a John Nelson who was charged with working a, or working a horse while in an unfit condition on a Saturday. Now, that's pretty bad news, isn't it, really? I don't know really what the story was behind that, but um, there were, even in those days, um, people who were looking out for the animals that were being used in this trade. He, this is John. He, he was Elizabeth's brother. Uh, and then from then on, Elizabeth ran the business um, herself. And it turns out that this Bowsfield that I found in these directories earlier um, was actually her nephew, Robert. And it seems like she adopted this boy um, when her older sister died shortly after he was born. It's a long and really sort of sad story. Anyway, they were obviously very fond of each other. She virtually raised him because her mother was blind. So as quite a young woman or teenager, she raised this boy um, and they continued this carrier service together until, as I said before, 1906. And she ends her days um, retired and living off private means um, in a relatively large house with six rooms in New Biggin. Um, and we find the last find her in the census in 1911 named Betsy. I'd love to see a photograph of her. I bet there's somebody out there who's related to her. And then finally, um, as I just mentioned, the pack horses. This is the earliest Nelson. Um, I had a genealogist friend who did some research for me, and she, she found this reference to um, a baptism of a daughter to Dorothy and William Nelson. And he was a worsted, a wor it says worsted, but worsted woolen, woolen cloth carrier in 1778. And that would have he may possibly have started his career with pack horses. So that might be the link back to that previous form of transport. So that's all the rabbit holes. There are a whole lot more if you go onto the blog and have a little look there. As I say, I'm in the final year of the project and having done all this research and worked with lots of community groups and come up with loads of really, really interesting stories, I've lo located all these stories geographically and it's now my job to share those stories with the wider public. Now, um, you heard mention of my Dairy Days project, was the one, which was the one that I did um, previous to this. Um, this. These are some of the examples of what you would call interpretation. So from a very large exhibition at the Downs Countryside Museum, through to beer mats with um, a cheese a quiz, uh, and the more conventional interpretation panels, um, which um, you may see a few of around Westland as time goes on. Uh, and also these very popular um, walk packs. I did one for Dairy Days, and there's another one from the Every Barn Towns a Story project, um, which you can buy online at the Yorkshire's National Park website. Um, and we, what part of my idea was to work with a lot of local businesses 
So all the tourism businesses who were interested in Muca and in um, Wensleydale who wanted were given copies of these. They put them in their little bookcases so that their, client, their customers and visitors and people who are staying in holiday cottages can borrow them. Uh, and they're handed out free of charge, as I say, to all the local businesses. So I'm looking forward to telling some of these stories now um, and showing people all the little, the little stuff as well. The Ravenstone Dell History Group showed me these. I don't know whether you can spot them, the cart stops. These iron cart stops, which just protect the corners of the Black Swan um, in Ravenstone Dell. And I like to imagine uh, Betsy Nelson and her, and her nephew, um, John, banging the wall with their car as they travelled at speed up and down through Ravenstone Dell and getting into bother with the, the owner of the pub. So there we go, that's it, that's me, that's my email address. Um, as I say, just Google away through Westmoreland and that's um, the best way to get onto the blog um, and find out some more of the rabbit holes that I went down. So thank you very much.